In this lesson, we're going to continue to discuss character panel formatting. If you'd like to follow along, go into the file menu to open, and in the sample layouts folder, scroll down to 0601-0602 character formatting, and just click open. In the last lesson, we left off talking about kerning. Kerning is a way to make the spacing between the characters equal. The next field is tracking. It takes that equal spacing and makes it tighter or looser. Why don't we just scroll up a little bit and select the first paragraph of body text. And we're going to click the down arrow next to that tracking icon. And you can see it's taking the even spacing and making it tighter and tighter and tighter. If I click the up arrow, it's going to make it looser. If you happen to be switching from Quark to InDesign, these numbers probably seem really strange to you. That's because InDesign's tracking numbers are five times more, five times greater than what you would find in Quark. So if I were to go to minus, how about I go under this little options pop-up menu and I go to minus 25, that's the same thing as minus 5 in Quark. So it takes a little getting used to. The next section is vertical and horizontal scale. These two fields, the settings actually distort the typeface of the selected characters. So vertical scale actually stretches the text vertically. Let me show you what I'm talking about. I'm going to go to the pop-up menu, and I'm going to go to, let's say, 200. That's going to stretch the type twice the size in the height that it is in the width. So it's literally distorting the typeface. Not a good thing. I never use vertical scale. The reason being, I'm going to zoom in a bit here. It's changing the height of the characters by stretching it out, but it's not adjusting the letting. So my characters are actually running into each other. Let me just go back down to 100%. And I'm going to instead make lettering that looks condensed in the same way as stretching it out vertically, only I'm going to do it with horizontal scale. I'm going to choose 90%. You can see that it is squishing it slightly. Now, anytime you squish or distort the characters to extremes, it's not going to be a good thing. Let me show you. I'm going to click down and I'm going to choose 25%. It's distorting the type so much that it doesn't look like the same typeface anymore. The parts of the characters that are supposed to be the thickest are now the thinnest. The parts of the characters that are supposed to be the thinnest are now the thickest. So not a good thing. If I were to go to like 90% instead of 100, there's not that much of a difference. And it's distorting the type only slightly. So it's not messing up the letter forms to an extreme. For some of my training clients, I don't even mention horizontal or vertical scale. Type purist would never think of distorting type in any way because it's not what the type designer had in mind. So let me just go back to 100%. The next section is called baseline shift. You can see it's taking one of the characters and shifting it upward. What is that about? There's really only a couple of usages of baseline shift that you should even consider. Let's say I had a logo. I'm going to go to my type tool and just type the word logo. I'm going to add a register mark after it. I'm going to go under my type menu to insert special character to symbols, register mark. And you can see it added a register mark. Well, if this was a headline, even though it's not that big of a register mark, I may still want to make it smaller. 
Well, watch what happens if I make it smaller in the point size field and I start going down to 10 or 9 points. Well, it's moving the R closer down to the baseline of the type. So how do I raise it back up? That's where baseline shift comes in. If I click the up arrow next to baseline shift, you see that it's moving that register mark further back up where it belongs. There are other uses that we will be talking about as we go through the features, but that is the major use. Why don't we select a word? And there are certain typefaces that the italic style for that typeface may be a bit fancy. Let me show you. I'm going to go to Adobe Garamond Pro, which is what this typeface is. And instead of regular, I'm going to choose italic. Kind of fancy. There are also some typefaces that may not even have italic. But what if I wanted to make type look italic when it doesn't exist? Or when that particular style in a certain type family is too fancy? Let me select some other word. And instead of making it italic in the style field, I'm going to click my up arrow next to this, which is skew or false italic. It's slanting the type over one degree at a time. I'm going to go to about 13 or 14 degrees, and I'm going to click off of it. Now, is that italic? Absolutely not. But if I really had to use italic, this could be acceptable. So it is a good alternative if italic doesn't exist or it might be too fancy. We're going to continue to discuss character formatting in the next lesson.